Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. Welcome to Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered. I'm Koen van Seyen, your host. Today I'm talking with Esther Park, CEO of Sienega Capital, the investment arm of Sally Calhoun, who I've interviewed last year. Together with Sally, she invests and grants in the regenerative agriculture space. We covered a lot of ground in this interview, how Esther got started in this space, the recently launched No Regrets initiative, and how their portfolio is doing. Of course, not just looking at the financial return. Without further ado, the interview with Esther. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why am I focused on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. Before we get started, I've been recording these interviews next to my day job and I will definitely continue to do so and release about an episode a month. But at the same time, I would love to take this further, share more interviews. There are many more stories to share on investing in regenerative food and agriculture. More depth, improve the quality, maybe even doing some video series. So I started a Patreon community, which makes it easy to support creators like myself. If these podcasts have been of value to you, and if you have the means, I invite you to support me and make this happen. For more information, please find the link to my Patreon account in the description below. And now, without further ado, the interview. Enjoy! So today I'm joined by Esther Park of Sienega Capital. Welcome, Esther. Thank you. So to start with a personal question, how did you end up in the soil building space? Well, <laughs> it was a long series of accidents. Um, I actually uh, started out in social welfare. That's what I did my undergraduate degree in. Um, and I, um, as I got into the community and economic development space, I started working in um I would say first social finance, so socially motivated finance. Um, so really small business and affordable housing type of um, lending and investing. And then um, I didn't really start to get into food until I started working in social enterprise. Um, so in my previous life, I worked at RSF Social Finance, and uh, we started a social enterprise lending program there. And it just happened to be that around that time, there was a big uptick in companies doing uh, organic and fair trade food and beverages. And uh, that really kicked off a lot of the work that we started in social enterprise. So kind of by happenstance. Um, I started in get, getting involved in food companies. Um, and because RSF is uh, inspired by the work of Rudolf Steiner, um, some people may know that he was the progenitor of biodynamic farming. So as a result of being there, I also was able to get a sense of what ecological principles of farming uh, looked like and how that related to our food system and what kinds of foods we ended up with on the grocery store shelves. So that was really my entry into the food space. Um, I got to know a lot of terrific entrepreneurs who are very passionate about where food comes from and, and why we should think about it um, in a very responsible way. Um, but I, you know, I have to say that many of the companies that I worked with during that time were what we call consumer packaged goods. So things that you see on grocery store shelves, as opposed to, um, you know, those folks who are really working directly with farms and farmers. And so um, I didn't start getting a good understanding of soil health until I left RSF and started talking with Sally Calhoun, who has previously appeared on your podcast. And um, she really started talking to me about what was going on on the land, um, what was happening particularly with native grasses here in California, um, how using livestock could really regenerate the soil and bring back those native grasses, but also started to 
uh, tell me about how soil has the capacity to absorb carbon from the atmosphere. So not only is focusing on soil really great for ecological and nutritional um, reasons, but it's also great for environmental reasons. So just getting a better understanding of what role the soil plays in our entire ecosystem really started getting me excited and passionate about that work. And so as I, as I worked more and more with Sally, um, I just started diving into the topic, uh, doing a lot of research, attending conferences, learning from scientists. Um, and now I've become a huge soil health advocate. So that was kind of my roundabout path into the topic of soil health. And, and what was your first response? Because it's the reason I'm, I'm doing this podcast, uh, the, the raw soil plays in both the carbon and the climate discussion, as well as, as uh, healthy food and, and healthy waterways, etc. But what was your first, like your, when you heard about what soil could do, what, what was your response to that? Well, my initial response was, why didn't I know this? And why doesn't everybody know this? It just felt like kind of the big secret that nobody knew. <laughs> um, so I was, uh, I was surprised and I was astonished and, um, you know, and then immediately went to, okay, well, let's work on this. Let's work on this issue for ourselves, but also let's work on it in terms of how we can help um, other people come to understand this more as well. And, and you have been extremely busy on that front. Can you tell a bit more? Because when I interviewed Sally, and I will definitely link that podcast below in the, in the show notes, but there was no regrets wasn't there yet. We were talking about an initiative that was going to come out, but now it's live and it's thriving. Can you share a bit with, uh, with me what, what that initiative, the No Regret Initiative, is about and, and why it's so important and why soil is really the centerpiece, uh, centerpiece of that? Yeah, so the No Regrets Initiative is, um, it has sort of two missions. One is, it's a way for us to talk about the work that, that we do. Um, so uh, just kind of reviewing a little bit of what your conversation with Sally was, you know, she has the ranch um, in, in Central California, and then there's the Globetrotter Foundation, which is the family philanthropy, and then there's Cienega Capital, which I run, and that's the investment fund. And so, you know, she will tell you that all these three entities are created as such for tax purposes, but in her mind, those are all assets that are working towards soil health. Um, and so we call it a regenerative asset strategy. Uh, so we're agnostic as to the type of assets, um, so whether they're real assets in the form of the ranch or philanthropic or investment assets, all those assets are meant to work together towards the purpose of regenerating agricultural soils. Um, and so we focus on soils because that's our main focus, but it's also, the reason it's our main focus is because there are so many co-benefits to focusing on the soil. So. A, it's better in the long run for farms, um, for their livelihoods, um, for their security in the future. Um, it's also incredibly important for nutritional quality of our food. So if anybody's interested in human health, um, the soil is incredibly important for that. Uh, there have been studies both in the UK and the US that have shown a significant decline in the nutritional density of foods. Um, in, in the United States. And there are some statistics that say we need to be eating four to five times the amount of vegetables to get the same nutritional content as we did before 1940. And we're eating less and less, basically. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, th there's also the, the co-benefit of water. Um, so a lot of the water crises that we have seen, particularly around algae blooms and nitrogen overload, is a direct result of runoff from uh, farms that are applying chemical and synthetic fertilizers. Um, you know, plants uh, and the soil are only able to take up a certain percentage of what is being applied there. The rest of it runs off into our water system and it creates problems for everybody downstream. It creates problems for drinking water. It creates problems for um, sea life and ocean life. And so there's lots of those kinds of co-benefits with healthy soil 
a healthy soil is able to absorb much more water um, and it's able to filter it as well in a way. Uh, so all that, you know, uh, and if you're doing, if you're really treating the soil well, you're not adding all those uh, synthetic fertilizers as well. So, um, uh, and then there's the climate benefit. So carbon is everywhere, but we've got obviously too much of it in the atmosphere. And soils love carbon, soils love to retain carbon, but they need something green growing out of it to absorb that carbon into the soil. Um, so the healthier the soil, the more carbon it can sequester. And so we, we feel like with this, with the urgency of climate change that we're seeing, uh, we really need to focus on these agricultural soils because they can be huge carbon sinks if we focus on them um, and treat them in the right way. So we feel like, you know, soil being sort of the basis of life, we could potentially solve a lot of issues out there by uh, focusing or by understanding what creates healthy soil. And so the No Regrets Initiative, the website itself is meant to help people understand what soil health is and what contributes to good soil health. Um, and it's also meant to inspire other investors and philanthropists to take action uh, to either start directly investing in this topic or to incorporate it into their decision making. So, for example, if your topic is really more about urban water um, or drinking water, uh, you know, we're not asking you to change your focus to soil health, but in the work that you're already doing, recognize the importance of soil health to the work that you're doing and incorporate that into your decision making. So that's really what we're looking to inspire people about. And so the website is a great informational hub, but we're also doing some great in-person activities too uh, to help people see what diversity and, and regeneration looks like on the land to connect with other investors and philanthropists. Um, and create, you know, some community around that as well. This is really meant as a as a step beyond your obviously your own portfolio, the portfolio you're managing. And and is that a, a big transition for you guys coming from how do we put this money to work that we manage ourselves to how do we influence others and, and what's the strategy on that? Is it a big big change or is that a relatively natural transition in, in the impact you want to have? I would say it's a pretty natural transition. I mean, we're not we're not trying to create a vehicle for other people to invest in. Um, we're not setting ourselves as uh, investment advisors. So um, I think it's more a lead by example kind of model where uh, we are actively doing it on the ground and we're willing to share any information that we have and what we've learned and how we're doing it. Um, as a way to inspire other people because, um, you know, just as land man management is contextual, I think investing in philanthropy is also contextual. And so, you know, if somebody's inspired to do this in, let's say, sub-Saharan Africa, we don't know anything about that place. <laughs> we don't know anything about the culture, about the land, about, you know, uh, the ecosystem there. But hopefully based on some of the examples and principles of what we're doing, they could apply some of that to their own local context. Um, and obviously, you know, here in California, we are in a pretty progressive environment. And so what our investing in phil philanthropy looks like in California even looks very different than what we're doing in, say, Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah, no, obviously. And, and so... Just to dive a bit more in, into that, how does the investment strategy of Cienega Capital look like? Where did it start and, and where do you... No, those are too many questions in one. How does it look like and where did it start? <laughs> yeah, so our investment strategy is really to look at mission first. Um, so it really has to advance soil health in... Um, again, in a contextual way. So what that looks like, again, here in California looks different than maybe in some other states. Um, and just to clarify, we're only working in the United States um, because we feel like it's a context that we know. And when we go outside of California, we try to find local investment partners 
uh, to do the work with us because they have the local knowledge and context that will help inform our strategy, but also they can be boots on the ground in case um, there's some assistance needed with either the business or the nonprofit that we work with. Um, I will say that we are a high risk model. Uh, we, we like to think of ourselves as the investors of last resort. Um, so if, uh, if a company or a farm or a business can get financing elsewhere, we really encourage folks to, um, to find local sources of financing. Uh, and if that's not available to them, then, then we will assist. And so oftentimes you'll find that a lot of the folks in our portfolio tend to be fairly early stage businesses. Uh, we do work directly with farms and farmers, which many folks won't. So that is also unique. Um, and uh, we don't have a target investment return. Um, so we see our return as being more than just the financial return. Uh, so we do want to see the, the investment come back. Uh, but in terms of how much more it comes back than the amount that we invested, uh, we're pretty agnostic to that. Um, that said, I do have a general philosophy around um, not spoiling our uh, borrowers and investees. Um, I give them as market rate terms as possible uh, because, um, you know, because of the stage that we tend to invest, I don't want them to be surprised when they go, when they're ready to go off into the traditional marketplace and find other sources of financing. Um, and I want their business model to be able to withstand um, the, the financial rea realities of going out and, and obtaining that other kind of financing. Um, so our structures tend to look very, fairly traditional. Um, also, we are investing across the spectrum with, in terms of products. So we don't just do equity investing. We don't just do loans. Uh, we pretty much do everything in the spectrum. And so if you incorporate the philanthropic work as well, you know, we're doing everything from grants to equity and everything in between. So um, we're a very highly customized kind of shop. When we, uh, I, I often make the analogy that we're like the village cobbler. So if somebody comes to us and says, I need a shoe. And we say, okay, well, what do you need it for? What does it need to, what function does it need to serve? And what size foot are you? And we're trying to uh, figure out how to outfit that shoe um, for that person. And so the financing is the same way. We, when we approach uh, or when we're approached by somebody who needs financing, oftentimes the initial conversation, conversation is around what is the kind of financing that you need? what is the most appropriate for where you are and where your business is, and then we will customize it to fit you. And so sometimes I'll pull from Globetrotter Foundation if it's, let's say, a low interest loan that needs to be made to a nonprofit organization. Um, I'll do it as a PRI from the foundation. Um, but if it's you know an equity investment um, into a food processing company, I'll pull that from Cienega Capital. So because we have the entire range of tools available to us, we can pull on any of those to meet the need of that particular situation. And I mean, this creates a lot of follow-up questions for me, but I will go, I will go one by one. <laughs> How has been the, the result so far, not the result as in the financial result, but how has been the, the overview if you look at the three legs of the stool, basically, in terms of uh, if you want to share what, how much do you invest, did, did you have a lot of because you're so high risk, a lot of uh, failures in terms maybe of investing, but still maybe progress in terms of, of soil health. What is your general overview of, of how the, the full portfolio from philanthropy all the way to equity has, has done so far? And how many years are we talking about? Right. So um, I will say that we have um, the performance of our portfolio is, you know, I would say it's mixed. Um, it's quite good in the sense that, you know, it, we're pretty early on. So I've been working with Sally for, you know, three years. And um, so I think there's some seasoning <laughs> that needs to happen in the portfolio. So it's a bit early to say because 
many of our investments have been just made uh, fairly recently. Um, but most of them are still alive. Yeah, yes, most of them are still alive. Um, we do have... Which is good after three years. It is, I mean, it yeah. is. Yeah, we have, um, let's see. So in Cienega Capital, um, we have 28 investments outstanding. And we have about, we have two uh, that are not currently performing. Um, so our loans and investments really range. We'll do, we've done small loans in the range of $25,000 to a farmer for irrigation pipe or sheep fencing. Um, so we will do something that small. Uh, we have also invested a uh, million dollars um, equity investment into um, a, a company that's farther down the supply chain. Um, and no regrets total. So this is Globetrotter, Cienega, but there are also other pots of money that we have access to. Uh, we have 20 million outstanding uh, with 50 total investments. And, and that number is a little bit skewed because we have a lot of philanthropic assets that um, are waiting to be utilized. And so one of the things that we have done with those philanthropic assets is invested them in funds. So we're, we're pretty clear that we want to be investing as directly as possible, but because we have some of this money sitting around, um, we decided to deploy it to other intermediaries. And so those investments tend to look bigger, right? So if you invest in a fund, oftentimes that investment is going to be a bit larger. So, you know, those are more in the million, two million, you know, range. So those are bigger investments that we've made there. And and when it comes to, you you mentioned an, a number of times, the importance of soil and, and soil carbon or soil health. Um, when it comes to measuring that, w what are you doing in that space from the farm, obviously, but also on, on the processing companies you're investing in? Yeah, so we're not currently measuring our impact in, in the traditional way. Um, and I think we're still really working on that. I, we're not really interested in counting uh, carbon levels. We're not interested in counting acreage. Uh, we're not interested in sort of a lot of the numerical kinds of impact measurement that are out there. Yeah, it means you need to find a non-traditional way. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I have the luxury of working with a single investor. And so we kind of, we, we know what's going on in the portfolio. We know um, that there are folks who are creating really great co-benefits. Um, and so um, some of the things that we're looking at is, um, you know, at the farm level, right, what is going on with the diversity and with the ecosystem functions there? Um, so we look at that, although we're not, again, collecting data necessarily on it. We're also looking at um, how that uh, particular business functions in the greater ecosystem. So is it a necessary part of the ecosystem? Is it pushing the ecosystem towards change? Um, and with some of the companies that are farther down the supply chain, we really uh, work hard at the outset to determine whether or how deeply they're working with smaller uh, farmers that are regenerating the soil. Uh, so it's really important that we see that direct tie through uh, for companies that are uh, farther away from the farm. Um, so we're making sure that that happens up front. Um, and with some of the companies, you know, we, we do also sit on the board. Um, so we're able to keep track of the work that they're doing. Um, with with the farmers on the ground. Um, so I realize that can be a very unsatisfying answer in the sense that we're not really doing a lot of um, collection of data around the impact. Um, but we do feel good about supporting what we call bright spots in moving the needle forward. And so it's really based on relationships. So what we see coming out of the relationships that we have with them. And, and speaking on, on those relationships with farmers, you mentioned before, like unlike many other investors in the space, you actually also invest in farmers. And, and you mentioned one with uh, or one example of an irrigation uh, system, etc. Can you share some more examples and some more reasons why you are doing this and others might not be doing this? 
as they are so key in, in the whole soil discussion and soil uh, restoration. Yeah, so a lot of people, a lot of lenders in particular don't want to work with farms because there is just the inherent mother nature risk that can't be controlled. So, um, you know, acts of God, you can't control. <laughs> so if there's a flood or a drought or, you know, something happens in nature, oftentimes that can be very difficult for a farm. And it creates a lot of variability in their, uh, in their revenue and their earnings and their operations. Um, but we do know that working with farmers who are regenerating their soils, um, they're creating more resilient systems. Right. So earlier we had talked about uh, how soil, healthy soil has the ability to absorb and retain water into its system as opposed to just letting it run off the top. And so um, those farms are less susceptible to drought. They're more resilient in a drought situation than a traditional farm. Which should make them even more interesting for investors and lenders, etc. Right. They should. But I think, you know, that's why we're trying to help people understand this more, right? So what should they be looking for, right, um, when, they're, when they're considering a farm? And so, and obviously, if there's a diversity of activities and diversity of, um, you know, life going on at the farm level, uh, there's also a lot less risk in that as well, right? So on the, in the investing world, that's what they always tell you. Um, that diversity uh, reduces your risk. And that's true, I think, in a lot of other situations as well. And that's true on the farm. But does that mean, I mean, that, that does make it, as I've seen in many of these podcasts, more complex to understand as, as investors are used to <laughs> right. monoculture investments and monoculture software investments, but also monoculture agriculture investments. And if you come with a a farm which has 20 different revenue streams of 20 different products and probably even more on, on the diversity side, it becomes an e and it becomes almost e too easy to say no. So is that what you want to prove? Like these are interesting investments and they could be and they are essential to make and you're also trying to figure out how to make them then because they've largely been ignored. Absolutely. Uh, I think that's absolutely right. One of the things that we're really trying to work against is this sort of reductionist way of thinking that you just mentioned. So trying to reduce a problem down to a single element uh, is the way that our culture has developed. And that's the way science has developed. Uh, that's the way a lot of problem solving and investment also has been developed. And so we really are trying to embrace the complexity. <laughs> and so, yes, it makes it more difficult to understand, but I think at the end of the day, you get a much richer outcome. Uh, and so you see that on the farm level, and you also see that on the investment level as well. Um, and so I think if you can demystify uh, uh, some of the risks that are implied around complexity, uh, I think this is actually a much more interesting and rewarding way to invest. So, you know, in, in the investment world, you're always trying to reduce your risk, right? And so in the process of reducing your risk, you try to reduce your uh, analysis to the the smallest sort of single thing that you can point to. And I think that what nature tells us is that that's a that's a really sort of wrong-headed approach in the sense that everything works together. It's all symbiotic. As much as you want to try to reduce it to, down to one single thing, that's not the way that nature actually works. Which means you'll be constantly surprised. That's right. So, can you name an example of a farmer that that you've invested in or supported to that really em, em, embodies this uh, complexity that you've talked about before? Um. Let's see. There are many, obviously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, so, um, okay, let's, let's talk about Central Grazing Company. So uh, Central Grazing Company is a pastured lamb company out in Kansas. And they raise their own lambs. Uh, it's primarily for meat at the, at the moment. So they raise their own lambs, but they also source from other uh, lamb farmers in the region. 
Um, and so they aggregate that under their own brand and they sell it throughout the Midwest. Um, and the entrepreneur um, has really embraced complexity in terms of the landscape itself. So the way that the sheep are raised and the way that they're rotated on their pasture lends itself to the greatest diversity possible of the the grasses and and um, the plants that are growing out of the ground itself. Um, but also she is working on um, utilizing the entire animal. So when you send an animal to processing, yes, you get the meat, but there are all these other parts of the animal that often either get discarded um, or, uh, you know, repurposed into something else, hopefully. But usually, particularly with the smaller animals, they get discarded. Uh, so she is recapturing the bones um, to be sold to a bone broth company. And she is now currently working on a leather project uh, to repurpose the hides uh, into lambskins for um, various products that she's going to make herself. But she's also in talks with some major fashion brands uh, to supply uh, essentially grass-fed <laughs> lambskin. Regenerative leather. Yeah, yeah regenerative leather. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, she's constantly thinking about how this fits into the entire system, how we can bring more regenerative agriculture into various different supply chains. And obviously this increases the complexity of her business. Um, but it's she embraces it because she feels passionately that we need to do more um, in regenerating our landscapes um, and changing the way that that we um, utilize animals in our everyday lives. And, and how did you work with her? So she came as a referral to us and um, we started talking with her about her her business and um, she, her business was quite small. Uh, I mean, in some ways it still is, but uh, she was having typical growing pains where uh, she wanted to buy and she had demand for more lambs, but she had limited capital, uh, working capital to be able to purchase and process those lambs and then distribute and sell them to the grocery store chains that she was working with. Um, so that, her product is mostly frozen, so sometimes that working capital period is longer than uh, she can withstand or that she would like. Um, and so we were able to provide her with a loan um, to bridge that working capital cycle. So we gave her a line of credit initially. Um, and then over time, we've been plugging in uh, different sources of financing. We've increased her line of credit several times because she's been growing. Um, and then when she started to launch the, uh, the leather initiative, um, then that felt like kind of a new venture in a way, even though it's still under the same corporate structure. In a way, it was a startup business because it's, completely, it's a completely different business than the meat business. And so um, we initiated a convertible note to be able to help uh, launch that. And it's still not totally launched yet, but just to get over some of the initial costs of even just starting up that kind of business activity. And, and when she was scaling her, her meat part, um, how did she make sure and still make sure that, that the, the, sh the lamb that are grazed of the people she is sourcing from are graced to the same standards and the same landscape approach as she is doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a good question because that's something that she is still really working on. So right now, there's no third party, there's no good third party audit for that kind of thing. Um, right now, all of her suppliers are animal welfare approved. Um, so they are certified by AWA and AWA does have a grass fed, you know, sort of aspect to their certification. So you can get that, but it's not necessarily a regenerative standard. So that's still a question. She does carefully vet her suppliers before she brings them on board. Uh, right now she has about 10. So there's not so many that she can't keep track of them and what they're doing. 
Um, but she would like to have some kind of third party verification for the regenerative practices. And she's also very interested in partnerships with other organizations that can help train her farmers um, to keep doing better. Um, so that's that's an open question. And I think that, you know, when you're moving in a pretty new area like this, you find that the infrastructure to support it doesn't always exist yet. <laughs> so that's um, that's one of the challenges that she's facing and actually a lot of the industry, particularly in livestock. Yeah, definitely. And just to take one step back and look at, at your your daily work or the last months, what have you been particularly busy with and, and focused on what, what kept you, not maybe not what kept you awake, but what have you been extremely busy with uh, in the last few months that you are, you are happy to share? Sure. Um, well, I've been quite, quite busy <laughs> and it's actually not, not deal related. Um, so the interesting thing is, um, that there's not a lot of people who have this unique expertise of really understanding farms, farmers, soil health, um, and the food ecosystem, as well as understanding the financing piece. And so a lot of the work that I've been doing lately has actually been around being the quote unquote expert in the room. Um, so lending my expertise to various groups, various companies, um, and there are two, um, what I'll call networks that I'm quite involved with. Um, one is called the California food shed funders, and that's, that tends to be more philanthropy focused, but this is a pretty small, but intimate group of funders who really are passionate about the California food shed but also share an analysis around uh, what is regenerative and that we really need to focus on regenerative farming practices and helping farmers stay viable. Um, and so we have these monthly calls and quarterly meetings where we take deep dives to help improve the practice that we have around um, using particularly in this case philanthropy to to leverage the change that we want to see here in california um, on the other side of the equation we also have a group that that's called the herd um, and this is a group of both ph philanthropists and investors um, and in in many cases actually some of these folks are doing both as well um, and uh, it's focused primarily on grass-fed livestock at this point. But really, again, we all came from the camp of what's called holistic management, um, which is a, it, it's a decision-making framework, um, but has been applied uh, very rigorous, rigorously to livestock systems. Um, and, uh, and this was pioneered by Alan Savory, who some people may know, um, so we all come from that sort of background and perspective, and we came together to really share what we're doing, to share ideas, to figure out ways that we can collaborate with one another. Um, so I've been actually doing a lot of work just with other groups um, who are quite close to us um, and sharing practices, sharing ideas, trying to find ways to collaborate to move the needle forward in our field. Um, so there's been a lot of what we call this field building activity that's been going on in the last couple of months for me. And and when we would be talking in a year from now, like let's say February 2019, um, what would you, you be liking to look back at and say, I'm, I'm very happy we have achieved this, this and this. What, what are the main things you would like to achieve this year? So in that particular regard, I think what I'd like to see is that we have grown the number of people that are interested in doing this work with us, um, that we have fostered uh, more people to activate their investing in this way, and that hopefully we'll have some fruits out of our collaborations. Um, there's one currently that I can't quite talk about yet <laughs> publicly, um, but if this gets off the ground this year, that will be a huge success. Um, that, that we're cooking up, particularly for the grass-fed beef industry at the moment. Um, and uh, the other area that I'm, that I'm really hoping to spend more time on this year is actually figuring out how to bring more 
um, farmers of color into the conversation. Um, so, you know, 90% of farmers are white. Um, and so it's a very undiverse field. Um, I just, you know, I was at a Midwestern farmers conference not that long ago. And um, I think I might have been the only woman of color in the room um, out of 800 people. <laughs> Wow. No diversity. Yeah. No diversity. Diversity on the land, but not in the room. Right. Exactly. So we know there are farmers of color out there. We also know that there, particularly in California, there's a huge immigrant farmer population. Um, you know, in the Central Valley, we have lots of Hmong farmers. Um, we also have a lot of Latino farm workers and, and, and who are becoming farm owners. Um, and there are programs to help these farmers become or farm workers become their own, you know, sort of business owners in the farming world. So um, I think one of my pieces of work for this year that I'll feel successful is if I've, you know, helped to bring some of those groups into the conversation in terms of folks who are working with minority and immigrant uh, farmer populations, because I just feel like we need to round out that conversation. Yeah, no, definitely. And, and in terms of, of barriers, if you look at creating or building soil at scale what do you feel like from an investor perspective if you put on your investor head what are the main barriers to to i'm, I'm, I'm seeing soil everywhere i'm seeing people talking about the carbon the water cycles etc and and of course the biodiversity but what are the main barriers uh, to you to get this to scale and to get more serious capital or serious amounts of capital invested in in rebuilding soil yeah, so we have a very, I think, different notion of scale than most people do. Um, I think for us, uh, at one point we were trying to discuss, you know, what were some goals that we wanted for the No Regrets Initiative. And at one point, you know, somebody said a billion dollars. And, um, and while we do want a billion dollars to come into this investing space, I think what what I would really want more than that is to have a thousand investors. I don't want to have, you know, three investors come in and put a billion dollars into the space. I want a thousand investors to come in and put a billion dollars into the space. So uh, what I'm what I'm really looking for is to have more people doing this work. So kind of the farming analogy, right, is that we don't want fewer people managing larger and larger tracts of land we want more farmers on the land itself we need more people not fewer working the land and i think that in this investing space that's what i'm looking for too i'm looking for more people to do this work not fewer and and let's imagine there's a, a room a theater full of of impact investors listening to this podcast that are ready to 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 jump into this space they have read the books, they, they watch the videos, they know soil is key to everything they eat, they wear, they, they drink. Where should they start? What, what's your, what would be your advice or, or direction for them to, to start exploring the soil further and, and also activate their investment capital and also the philanthropic capital, of course? Yeah, so I think one of the first things is to um, obviously learn about what really contributes to soil health. Um, and so there is what we call the soil health primer on the No Regrets website, which you can go to and find lots of information. Um, and you, there, there are certain rabbit holes you can go down. So one of the things that we've done under each topic is said, read this first, because <laughs> there's lots of papers and articles that you can read. And you can go really in depth if you want, or you can get a higher level overview um, from just looking at the read this first articles. Um, so, you know, some education, obviously, but then on the investment side, um, we always just encourage people to do something. <laughs> just do one thing, um, you know, make one grant or make one loan or make one investment and just just see how that works out. See how that feels. Um, we we really encourage people to just get started in that way. Um, but the best thing that you can do in in sort of seeing finding that first thing is to build community. So get to know the people that are in your community that are um, 
really interested in ecological practices around farming. Um, and it might take a while to, to find them. Um, but, you know, some, some people I know have started at the farmer's market. Um, just, you know, seeing who's there, asking them about their farming practices um, and getting to know them and, um, you know, connecting with other uh, folks in the space. So, um, you know, here in California, uh, we, we do occasionally put on some events that are geared towards investors and philanthropists um, and are trying to build some community that way. Uh, so obviously there's um, opportunity there, um, but to also connect with other people who are local to you. I think that that's excellent advice. And, and I want to thank you for, for your time, Esther. And uh, I will definitely be checking in on, on this uh, teaser you, you, you mentioned, but you can mention yet in, in when, when that will be public and we can, we can talk about that. Great. Thank you, Kuhn. This was fun. You just listened to an interview with Esther Park of Sienega Capital, where we discussed the importance of soil and how to invest and grant in the soil building space. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you for making the time to listen to this podcast and making it all the way till the end. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you and if you have the means, please join my Patreon community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course investing in regenerative agriculture and food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees and what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soil builders and investors in this space. The soil builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc., etc. People that are building soil at scale. And the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals, or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations, um, institutional capital, banks, insurance companies, etc. Is this course free? No. This is pay what you think it's worth. Meaning I have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you. And I'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast, um, we have people with very different means. So I'm inviting you, if this course is creating value to you, and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're going to look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, and what kind of co-investors you could find or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soil builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking. Click on the link below, sign up, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.